Hello and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and the cool, creative, and sometimes incredibly important things we do with our images after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, your host, and this week my guest is nature, landscape, and travel photographer Jim Goldstein, and we're going to be doing something a little bit different this week. We are going to be talking about things that we do with our images after the shoot, but instead of post-processing and enhancing your photographs, we're going to be talking about making sure that your images are backed up and protected from hard drive failures or other catastrophes. And Jim Goldstein is a great person to have this conversation with because he really has his act together in terms of setting up a really solid backup routine. We're also going to give away another book from Rocky Nook, so stay tuned to the end of the show where I'll give you the details for how you can enter to win the Rocky Nook book of your choice. Well, Jim Goldstein, thanks so much for joining me here on The Fix. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, sure. And um, I, I see from, from the interwebs and, and postings on your blog that you have been in Yosemite recently chasing the moon bows. Yeah, um, April and May. I've been uh, trying to get there as best as I can during the full moon or very close to it to try to see if I could capture something. So is there, um, obviously I'm guessing anytime there's a full moon, there's a possibility of a moon bow by a waterfall. It doesn't have to be just in the springtime months. Is that right? Yeah, it doesn't have to be the spring. It doesn't have to be Yosemite. It can be anywhere. Um, sure. But the combination that's helpful is uh, that the moon is at the right azimuth, the right height in the sky um, in relation to the water and where you're standing. And for Yosemite, the window is very uh, small. It's usually just the spring because oh, okay. Interesting. Um, the, the waterfalls are seasonal. Um, of course, so like, right. So like in August, you know, some of the waterfalls will dry up because uh, there's no more snow to be melt, snow melt or there's no rain. Um, so for Yosemite, that one is a little bit unique. But, you know, I've seen moon bows from a variety of different places. I even just saw one recently of um, Kilauea, uh, national park the volcano national park in hawaii it was missed above the crater there and somebody got a mm -hmm. moon bow at night so i mean it's really it's possible anywhere you just have to know to look for it yeah you just have to have that uh, water vapor in in the air basically to uh mm -hmm. create those moon yeah. bows or rainbows that's cool. right and, so you... uh, just, just to clarify a moon bow is basically a rainbow at night and what happens is that uh, your cones, you have rods and cones in your eyes. And if I'm remembering this correctly, cones are uh, your color sensors. And at night, they switch off. So this is a purely human physiology limitation um, that at night, you can't really see the color very well. Everything goes bluish gray. Um, for some people, if the moonlight is incredibly bright, you know, you're like a unique evening where it's very, very bright out uh, from uh, the moonlight, then you might be able to see hints of color in in the moon bow and uh, it's kind of like magic from the old film days where you take a picture you don't know if it comes out um mm. so what you see with your eye you don't know if it's really there. you might see like a white arc and then your camera takes it and your camera sensor sees color all the time um, right and so you'll see magically you know this rainbow appear before your eyes on the back of your camera uh, so it's yeah, a very yeah. neat, it's a very neat phenomenon that makes sense and it's similar to um although much more subtle but but similar to when you're photographing the auroras up in the northern latitudes they always appear much more uh you know pronounced and visible on your camera yeah. uh capture than to your eye just you know mainly because of course the camera is a cumulative exposure based you know over several seconds so the light builds up yep um although i have been out in in some situations where it's been like a major aurora storm and they were uh, you know amazingly visible even to the naked eye yeah, and I think that's also going to play into some of the physiological limitations as well of our eyes. It's like it has to be a lot of light uh, mm -hmm. for the cones to kind of turn on and see see color. So that right, also right, right. Be, be an impact. So you get to use somebody pretty often, don't you? I mean, it would seem that. Do. It would seem that way. Yeah. Um, 
there are lots of subjects that that's just an easy location uh, to get right. those subjects. Um, I used to do workshops there and uh, some other things, but it's just a place that I personally really enjoy. In fact, I'm going to go back um, in actually this weekend. At the end of this weekend, I'm going to take my boys up there. And uh, I actually, as much as I talk about Yosemite through photography, I end up the past couple of years have gone twice as much because I end up taking my boys where there's no photography involved. And I just want them to enjoy the outdoors, which is very important to me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that'll be a, you know, significant memories for them and, and developing the love for, you know, that, that place and just, you know, the, the natural world and wilderness in general. Hope so. <laughs> have you, have, have you, yeah. So, so, and you, you've been going there for, for a, a number of years. I know. Uh, have you noticed, um, and now Yosemite has always been very, very popular with photographers, of course. Uh, well, not always, but you know, <laughs> uh, certainly ever since uh, ever since Ansel Adams uh, brought it to the, our national attention, uh, and you know, before that, you know, some of the earlier photographers. But um, have you noticed, like in the past ten years or so, a a palpable increase in the size of the, uh, for want of a better word, we'll call it photographer herds that gather at at certain key locations in Yosemite? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's a reflection of the increased popularity of photography in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think like social media, I mean, I can really go off on this one, but um, to try to keep it a little bit abbreviated, I think that, you know, the combination of the bar being lowered for uh, photography cameras and technology, and then the advent of social media and photo sharing yeah. forums, that's become more of the norm. I think people have a, a greater inclination to want to go there um, for the for the purpose of photography. Um, right, yeah. You know, you don't necessarily see the people who are doing photography also camping as much. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know that the love of the outdoors and photography is necessarily 100% on an even keel, but certainly they're related still. Uh, but people yeah. are very much intent on being there for certain phenomenon that different photographers have uh, made famous. Right. Like, you know, I, I saw recently, I think it's in February is when they have that, uh, the flaming falls where the sunlight hits yeah. the top of, of the waterfall there. And yeah. I saw some pictures of all the photographers there. Yeah. yeah the, the, um, of course I, I kind of semi blanked on it, but, um, the waterfall, if you're going to edit, then <laughs> I'll look it up actually. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, no. You mean the name of the waterfall? Is it Horsetail Falls? Yeah, or... Horsetail Falls. That's it. You beat me to it. Yeah, see, I, so Horsetail Falls. I, yeah, I was blanking on the name too. Yeah, There's so many but, significant falls there. Yeah, Horsetail Falls um, will will light up when the sun is at a certain point in the sky, usually in early February, early mid February. And uh, that one, this past year, there was footage of just like droves of photographers cramming very uh, tight lookout points. Uh, to get this this one shot, which was made famous um, first and foremost by Ansel Adams, except it was a black and white photo. And it could have been almost any time of year that he took the photo. But then back in like 1973, Galen Roll uh, took this photo in color because color photography was starting to come yeah. into its own. And um, he took a film color photo of it at that time of year, and it has gained a, a cult status. So everybody really wants this shot. Um, yeah. And ironically, yeah. I've not gotten that shot. I, I just have kind of avoided <laughs> the crowds over the years, and they just keep getting worse and worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a reality. But yeah, I think you're right that social media and sharing pictures and people having their photographic bucket lists and stuff like that definitely probably plays into yeah. a lot of that. Not a bad thing. But, it just uh, plays into the crowds, yeah. that's all. Yeah, 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 sure. So, you know, there's all those photographers taking all those pictures, and then uh, it makes you wonder how many of them are backing things up, which brings us to our, sure. our, our primary topic today. Um, and um, the, the reason that I asked you to join me here is that um, I know that you are a, uh, a photographer who, who probably has his act together in terms of backing things up. Uh, I know from things, uh, articles of yours that I've read over the years. And uh, you're also the director of marketing for Backblaze, which is a online backup service. So you're, you know what's going on in that venue. 
So um, let's start off by uh, asking you a, a rather personal question, uh, not too intimate, sure. but somewhat personal. <laughs> okay. Do you do you have any um, uh, hard drive crash data loss horror stories to, to share? Yeah, sure. sure. I, I've always been an incredibly paranoid individual when it comes to um, digital file loss uh, or data loss. And this kind of stems back to my days back in college uh, where I used to oversee computer labs. And there were people, this is like back in the day with like floppy disk, you know, people were saving their thesis to a floppy disk and, um, and they'd be like, Hey, you know, like this computer turned off by accident because somebody moved a cord and now I can't find my file. And I, just from that experience very early on, it just became ingrained in my skull and brain yeah. that, um, you know, you always, always back up. And, you know, when I was shooting film and slide, um, it wasn't like the end of the world if I lost a file because I could always rescan. But with digital photography, yeah. um, backup has become much more of a critical component of a photographer's like workflow and how they how they operate. So I would like to say that my act is at perfectly together. It's not necessarily the case, but I definitely have a lot of safeguards in place um, that the last time I had a loss of a drive uh, was in 2009. So I've got a good mm. streak going and I dodged a bullet on that one. I had um, the drive backed up kind of a mirror. And so it wasn't oh. horrible, but it was more so the pain of, you know, copying things back over. And at the yeah. time I was also reassembling doing everything. Backups. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that still becomes time intensive, but um, yeah, I mean, so I could go on and on, but we'll we'll provide a little bit more structure to the conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we'll, that's we'll the last time it happened. Yeah, well, you know, the, the reason I mentioned that is that um, uh, even though I know that a lot uh, a lot of photographers are are hip to this concept that you know uh, the information that's stored on hard drives is uh, somewhat ephemeral, <laughs> it it can go away in an instant if the drive suffers catastrophic failure or, uh, you know, uh, if there's some other catastrophe like a fire or a flood, yeah. you know, I live up in the Sierra, the Sierra foothills in a forested area. And so you know, getting into this time of year now, uh, you know, there's the very real possibility that God forbid a, a wildfire could roar yeah. through the neighborhood and just leave it, you know, ashes. Yeah. Um, hopefully that so, does not happen. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't happen, but it, it could. So, um, and, uh, you know, I'm always, um, even though I know a lot of photographers more and more are hip to this and, and, and establishing a backup regimen is easier than it ever has been. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed in, in my consulting work that I do with clients, uh, that I, I run into some people sometime who still have either nothing in place at all, which just yeah. kind of gives me the total heebie jeebies. And I want to totally become an evangelist right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so or, easy. or they yeah. have something in place that has a lot of big holes in it that could be problematic yeah. you know so yeah um, I think back back then when, when i lost data um you know the best practice i mean the best practice in general as a whole is it's called a three two one backup strategy which is you have three copies of uh of your data um two copies on different uh, types of media so in the back in the day it would be like hard drive and dvd and then you have one copy off-site that's that's mm -hmm. the that's still the overall best practice. Um, I am guilty of morphing that into something a little bit different these days. Um, I rely primarily on hard drives, um, mostly because uh, hard drives and cloud service. So uh, the reason for this uh, slight shift is that um, it's just time intensive. If you're dealing with enough data, then what happens is that a recovery can be um, almost as almost as traumatic as the data loss itself in terms of uh, lost time and money. Yeah. Um, you know, when the drive fails, you're like panicking, where can you find these files? And usually you notice that it fails when you actually need a file. <laughs> that's yes. that's right. how it happens. So you're freaking out at that point on that level. And then you're freaking out about like, how much time is it going to take once you find the backup to actually restore it? Um, so when I lost data a long time ago, I, I took it upon myself as, um, the, the chance to kind of like shore things up. So there was, there were no holes and to minimize, um, the downtime. And so the way that I set things up at that point 
um, was I consolidated all of my enclosures. I had like eight different drives or something hideous of all different sizes on my my desktop and it, they were drives that i accumulated over time they ranged from like yeah um 16 gigabytes to at the time what was really big was 750 gigabytes and um it was just a mess and i couldn't keep track of where things were so i ended up getting a multi-bay enclosure that was um eSATA which is very fast um, Thunderbolt is the way to go these days. Um, and as soon as I mm. upgrade my computer, I will switch things over to that format. Um, but the way I set it up is that I, I use a software RAID on my computer and I write um, in a mirrored fashion to two drives. So if one drive locally fails, I have another drive that I can pull the data from. And uh, periodically, I will have a third drive that I insert into the enclosure and I will back up what's on those two drives. It's the same copy. So it's really, mm -hmm. if I have two one terabyte drives, it's actually one terabyte of data. And I'll back it up to another third one terabyte drive, for example. And then I'll take that drive and I'll keep it somewhere else, somewhere outside of my house. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I know other photographers that will keep it in different geographic locations. Um, so in your case, if there was a fire and you kept your offsite drive at your neighbor's house, that's not really helping you. So maybe exactly have, yeah yeah so if you have kids that are going to school somewhere and they're responsible and they're not going to spill a beer on it um then maybe <laughs> leaving it there or, or maybe better yet is like at your mom's house or something like that and then the other thing well, I do is i i back up to the cloud as well so that right, way it's yeah. truly offsite and, and i can get it at a later time so the the key there um in all of this is redundancy having more than one copy on different types of media and, and also especially having one offsite. I do have an offsite backup and uh, I don't really have any uh, locations here in town in this smaller rural area where I live in the foothills where I could have it kind of nearby offsite. And you bring up a good point where if I had it at my neighbor's house uh, and, a, and a fire wiped out the neighborhood, that's not doing me any good. So what I do is I have a, a larger safe deposit box at our bank in town, which is about six, seven miles away. You know, it is not in a, an area that would be threatened by uh, a wildfire. And of course it's in the vault. Um, yeah. So I, I have my offsite back up there and I update that maybe every couple of weeks, you know, so, so that's a hole in my system right there that if, if I did have a, um, uh, and I also have a back, uh, another backup here on the desk. So I've got, I'm backing up my main image archive to a drive here on the desk. Then I have the offsite, but in the event of some catastrophe that, you know, yep. uh, took the house out, uh, I would have that gap that, you know, whatever that one week or two week gap, if, if I had to rely on going to my offsite backup, which is why I'm, I'm kind of interested in um, the opportunities and possibilities offered by an online backup system. Yeah. So tell I, us a little bit about that. Sure thing. Before I get to that, I, I will share with you one kind of semi-humorous story, which was you also have to be careful where you keep your offsite backup. And for a while when I was doing DVD backup, and I still have my oldest photos um, on that as a backup, um, I actually was moving or something like that. And I kept the backup in my car. Like it was basically no. like, a, like a book of, um, DVDs and it was in, in plastic car. sleeve pages, right? Yeah. yeah and, it, and it was in San Francisco and, um, somebody broke into the car and they must've thought that they landed cause it was a really big, um, actually it was like this, it's like this really big book of so they must have thought like they got like an entire music library and then they opened it and they saw that it was worthless gold dvds with fit with pictures on it that they couldn't listen to and um strangely enough um two months later somebody called me and said that they found it um, oh really somebody just ditched it so i was planning on like oh well i guess i'll just have to burn time and reduplicate my other set of dvd uh backup and it yeah. came back perf in perfect condition. And um, one thing that I will say with this is that in the event that something you have a moment like this, where you're not thinking hundred um, percent is that on the DVDs, on the drives, like identify whose it is on the outside, you know, put your number, put your email address, put your name. Yeah. And, uh, 
This is true for drones as well, because um, they have <laughs> a higher frequency of going missing. But for drives, it actually, and for uh, DVDs, that worked out really, really well. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 if, it, on the off chance that you, you run into an honest person who wants to take the time to get it back to you, if, if you do have your contact information on there, they can. But if, yeah. if you don't, you're, you're out of luck. Pretty much. But you know, I had a... Um, I was gonna say I I you know for a while I had a, a DVD backup too. I had a big binder just like what you showed, and I would you know back up to the DVDs. I guess this is the time when the DVDs were what containing this was before Blu-ray, so they were holding like four point yeah. three gigabytes of of data mm -hmm. or something like that. But you know, eventually, as you know, that just became uh, too uh, awkward and impractical as camera files became larger and working files became larger and suddenly it was just sort of a total pain to try to back up and main a dvd archive maintain yeah. a dvd archive not to mention that if you do have stuff stored on that type of medium every once in a while you need to migrate it to another you know a fresher medium yeah and the yeah, same thing with hard drives as, as well Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean that that is the one thing is that it's it's a it's a long term play. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for film <laughs> that a negative is a negative, or a positive is a positive, and that's not like a format that's changing. Um, you still need to optically transfer it um, by a scan, but um, with digital files, it's you know there's all kinds of different things that you have to take into account. There's uh, file formats are always changing. The formats of uh, the medium, the media that you're backing up to. Um, so it's not like you can back it up and forget it. Um, there has to be a larger strategy in place and you just have to be aware of what the limitations are. Um, it became apparent to me really quickly that, uh, like you said, DVDs became too cumbersome. Um, they kind of weren't scaling, uh, to the, how quickly, uh, file types were increasing or what your working file sizes would be. Uh, and to back them up, it's like, okay, am I going to back up like six gigantic panoramic uh, PSB files <laughs> to, to like one DVD and back up all the other source files? It's just is too much to think about. And hard drives seem to be at a place where they're cheap enough, they're um, in large enough capacity now, and uh, the transfer speeds are high enough that they are becoming more ubiquitous as a means to do your immediate backup. And a lot of the cloud storage uh, companies, Backblaze included, um, they're also dealing with this um, scale, uh, kind of like hype, uh, exponential growth in scale of uh, drive sizes and whatnot. So, you know, it's better to leave that to the professionals and mm -hmm. you know, leverage that for an offsite. Um, one less thing to worry about. Right, right. But you have an off-site uh, physical hard drive as well as uh, online cloud-based backup. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I do that. I, I, I mean, like I said, I go overboard. So I actually also have um, locally, like if I have a drive that I'm not working on, I have a, it's called a media safe. And um, it's, I wouldn't say it's like as secure as a, like an old uh, steel safe. Right, those are just to keep people out. A media safe is designed specifically to uh, protect what's inside from water and or from like fire. So what happens is it's kind of like a plastic or like a resiny kind of box, and it's got like really really thick walls to it. And there's not really it's almost like a small shoebox inside, but on the outside it looks like a giant shoebox, just like on steroids. Yeah. And if there's a fire that hits, it basically seals it. Huh. And then you have to like cut it and like and open it. So what? Excuse me. One it protects from the fire so that it um, seals up, and then it also protects from water in case there's you know they're using water to like put the fire out because the box right. kind of or, seals or, up. So it's or you just special. have a pipe burst. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, I have that also as an on-site, uh, you know fail safe as well. And fortunately I've never had to like really have anything happen with that. It's just there in case. Are those, uh, are those, um, media safes or are, are they like rated to a certain temperature in terms of their fire proof? Yes. Yeah. 
they're, they're usually rated at a much higher temperature and for a longer duration than say like uh -huh. a, a steel safe um like a yeah. traditional safe that you would use to like keep something out of a burglar's hands or something like that right 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 yeah and i got turned on to those a long time ago with film that's and it still works for digital medium yeah. Well, you know, you, you made a good point earlier when you said that, you know, uh, one good thing about film based media is, is that, you know, it, it, it's there in a, uh, a stable format uh, that's not really changing. You can always go and rescan it. Uh, but of course, it is susceptible to um, uh, damage or destruction from, yeah. you know, outside physical forces, whether that's you know, water, fire, mold getting on the, the, yeah. the film and stuff like that. Unfortunately, um, there's not and, one uh, format. It's, there's, there's a weakness to yeah. everything. Well, one of the advantages of, of digital images, uh, even though they are incredibly vulnerable if you're not backing them up, one of the advantages is that they can be backed up. You can make these identical copies of your entire yeah. uh, image archive and, and store it in a relatively small physical space, uh, depending on how much stuff you have. Right. Uh, so that's one of the good things. But... Um, yeah, I, I'm always trying to evangelize to people that, you know, they've got to do this. And I think one of the problems is that it requires that people be uh, an, uh, an electronic curator and, and, and kind of go off and learn all the stuff that, that may not come naturally to them if they're not, you know, totally um, conversant with all aspects of, of computers and computing and stuff like that. So I think that that is probably one of the big um uh impediments to you know people setting up a uh a good backup system yeah there's there's a lot i mean um there's actually uh like university level uh programs now for digital archiving um you go back to like what i used to write a lot more about copyright and the u.s copyright office it's different obviously for uh, their policies are different than, say, international copyright policies. Um, but one thing that's universal is how you manage all of this, uh, all of this data. And since more and more of it is digital, um, there's a whole specialty that's evolved for it. So there's a, a good thing for the individual photographer is that there's a lot more material out there to find and to learn about how to do this. But by and large, you know, I would say it's been fairly universal over the years that the three, two, one backup strategy um still holds yeah holds true yeah yeah and the redundancy is key mm -hmm. so let's talk about uh let's talk about the online backup options um sure. because that's something that i currently do not have in place um and, and you know the big hole in my system is is that that kind of gap where um since i only back up my my hard drive that is stored in the safe deposit box maybe once a week, or if I'm not doing a lot of stuff, it might be every yeah. two weeks, something like that. So, so if, if there's a catastrophe, I could potentially, you know, lose a few weeks worth of uh, images. And obviously if I'm in the middle of a big project, that would be a, a problem. Although yeah. if I am in the middle of a big project, I'm usually a little bit more paranoid about that and, and you know, have other things in place. But in the past, uh, when uh, I looked at when online backup first became a thing that was uh, available to us, I was always skeptical of it. Um, and this was, you know, a few years ago, I guess, four or five years ago. Uh, I was skeptical of it because a, I had a lot of image data to back up, you know, many terabytes worth. Um, and I thought that, well, you know, that seemed, would seem really cumbersome. The computer just have to be like, you know, working all the time uh, on the internet to, to upload that take a long time to get the initial uh, bulk of the data there on the, the cloud-based servers. And then, you know, if I wanted to, if, if I did suffer some sort of a crash, how, you know, am I going to have to like download it again and take like four weeks to download it? So those were some of my initial concerns with why I, I didn't get into um, an online backup situation. But how has that changed uh, since the early days? Um, I actually shared the same um, skepticism or hesitation um, with that. I remember mm -hmm. uh, being a guest on another podcast and we were talking about it, and I, I was much more negative about it at the time. Um, the difference these days is that people have um, a little bit of a fatter pipe, they have better bandwidth in many cases to be able to upload these things. And the software has matured as well. Um, there's something, for example, with Backblaze uh, called multi threading. And so if you are syncing a, a drive up to the cloud, um, it's possible to um, 
you know, optimize the speed at which the files are actually transferring um, up to to their site. So um, it does work out. There still is um, some limitations. Um, like with all things, I I am you know we talked about redundancy being key um, for files that are so the way Backblaze personal backup works is that it's a great thing to kind of um, upload your entire hard drive. So if anything were to happen, um, you can either restore it uh, with like a, a download to download the contents of your drive, like individual files or the entire drive, really, if you wanted to. Or you can actually now uh, request a, uh, an encrypted USB drive or an encrypted hard drive, and they'll send you the full drive back that you can basically just plug in to your computer. And they implemented a new, or we implemented a new program now also where you can uh, do this all for free to get the drive. You just basically send the drive back and there's no charge. Otherwise, you just keep the drive and there's like a very nominal chart, nominal fee for actually keeping the drive. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's very useful in, in that way. I, I will say that uh, on the, the topic of redundancy, what happens is that um, for files that I'm actively working on a lot, um, I know you do a lot with Lightroom. So for example, my Lightroom catalog is gigantic uh, from years of, uh, of images being in there. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll save out the backup. And in the old days, I used to just copy that over to a thumb drive and I have the thumb drive on me, mm -hmm. um, which we can really go down a rabbit hole with this one because all of my files are DNG. So all of the, all of the files, um, all the edits and whatnot are saved into the DNG file. I don't have like a separate XMP file or, or sidecar file. So everything is in there. So what happens is that I, the, what all I need to do is I need to back up all my, my files. And as long as I have the files and I keep them in the same hierarchy, if I have a backup of my catalog, if something fails, then I can combine the two and be right back where I was. Uh, working. All the edits are mm -hmm. still assigned to the files, the organization and whatnot on the catalog is still there. So I used to put the catalog on a USB drive, but now I just throw it up to um, the cloud so that I can pull it down um, much quicker and just keep running. And is that, uh, are you just putting that, you know, back in it up via Backblaze or, or some other cloud service like Dropbox just to sort of have a, another copy of it there? Both. I mean, to be a broken record, you know, the re for re reasons of redundancy, um, I'll have it in the cloud with with Backblaze, but I'll also have it um, on Dropbox and whatnot for, you know, just out of pure paranoia. Um, mm -hmm. Dropbox isn't, I don't consider that to be a backup. Um, it's uh, a short term solution uh, for like a working yeah. file, but it's not like a true backup. Uh, not, yeah. in, not in regards to like what I need. Yeah. And, and, and while we're just sort of, you know, on the subject of Lightroom, I just want to briefly mention to people that um, in, in addition to, of course, you know, backing up the main bulk of your image files, which is sort of a uh, primary topic that we're talking about here, although a uh, little tangent here, obviously any computer file, any digital file that is important to you should be backed up, you know, your financial information, yeah. you know, things like that, emails. Um, and but anyway, in terms of all your records, a, yeah, everything, you know, your, your digital life, you know, because we all have all this digital data, both our photographic data as photographers and, you know, the personal data that's associated with us that we have to be curators of. But anyway, apropos Lightroom, um, it is important to be, uh, on a regular basis, backing up the Lightroom catalog in addition to your main image files, if any, uh, a corruption voodoo should uh, work its way into the uh, catalog, which is, of course, just a database file. I think yep. you experienced that once. Didn't you have a Lightroom catalog go, I, go I, bad on you? I did. I, I did have a catalog file go bad. And I again, I dodged a bullet because I had this, uh, this practice in place of um, being super paranoid. <laughs> and if I was doing like a big edit afterwards, um, or if all week I'd been doing something and I wanted to make sure, I'd make sure that all the metadata was saved to the files for one. Um, mm -hmm. so that for one year, you actually need to, um, manually save still, I believe. And then yeah. after that, I was, uh, copying over the catalog to Dropbox and to the cloud, um, in order to make sure that that was, that was there. So I think I lost, I wasn't like super great at that time. 
and I still am not 100% bulletproof on it. You know, like it's easy to forget about doing this, but I think I lost maybe like a week's worth of edits or, you know, something with the catalog. Yeah. And, but that was like really yeah, minor. That's not I mean, too bad. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can recover from that pretty easily. Um, and even with um, upgrades, right? If you upgrade your operating system or you upgrade um, a version of Lightroom, um, you know, things happen. You know, it could, it could be that there's a bad, something bad in the code on the off chance that escapes QA, okay. um, or it could just be that there's some gremlin in your computer that causes a hiccup and then, you know, something gets corrupted in the process. So for all of those reasons, I tend to be much more paranoid about having my files backed up and making sure they're up to date before I do like big, big updates like that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's definitely good, good advice. And, and I, I do that the same the same way. Um, but, you know, the, the, the main thing and, and again, the, the reason that I wanted to, to talk about this is that, um, you know, I do run into situations where it, uh, you know, I, I have people who don't don't have a backup. And it, 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 if you're unaware of how to do this, it seems so daunting. But, um, you know, you just have to get started. Now, in terms of, of backup software for your online, or not your online, your um, your backup to your local drives there, do, what software are you using? Um, just OS X. So um, there's a way to configure through the disk utility um, to set up like a, a software RAID. And I basically just set up, mm -hmm. I think it's RAID zero, which is basically a mirror. So I have two drives yeah. and I say, these two drives are a mirror of each other and it will show up. It basically converts the two drives into one visible icon. And then I just save to that icon and it writes it to two different locations at the same time. Um, and okay. the, the faster your, the faster your connection, uh, you know, in my case, it's eSATA. It's just like writing to an internal hard drive. It's that, that same speed. If it's like a USB 2 or, you know, USB 3 is going to be much better. Um, you might notice a little bit of a, a difference. And if you have Thunderbolt, then it's going to be, you know, really fast. Right, right. So, so is that the sound of your backup engine? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Firing up there that. in the background? <laughs> an opportune time for the gardeners to show up. I wasn't sure if the YouTube oh, well. could hear that, but I, I can always mute as well when I'm not talking. I <laughs> know, it's. It's okay. It's it's real life, you know. We're <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not super polished here. This is just a yeah. So one thing, thing that I, good information. I will, one, one thing that I, I will add, which is unfortunate that there's this background noise, but um, so Backblaze is known for their personal backup solution, which backs up your all the drives that are attached to your computer. So the drives have to be on for the backup to happen. Right. But they're just uh, in the process of having a beta program for a new product called B2. And it's a much cheaper version of, uh, it, let me take a step back. It essentially is what they built their solution on. So they have done an expert job in creating a foundation of um, redundant drives as a foundation to their business. And they happen to have an application that backs up your computer to this uh, server farm of all mm -hmm. these drives. And they basically are saying, hey, you can now access all of these drives and you can do whatever you want with your piece of the pie in terms of what you store there. So it's basically an open ended storage facility for what you want to do. You can build an application, you can build the next Instagram and have it work off of this, or you could just use it as an archive platform that you copy over all your files. And this, um, as much as I love Backblaze, for example, there are limitations. Your drives have to be um on at least once every 30 days for the software to check that it's there otherwise after mm -hmm. 30 days they might you know say hey this is no longer in use and you've deleted it um and it's no longer there whereas b2 this is a platform that you can just copy everything keep it there as long as you want and there's a bunch of integrations that are happening um that make it much easier to use so it may not be for the faint of heart just yet but um, it, it's in beta, but it will be um, out of beta at some point. And when it's out of beta, there will be a lot of integrations that make it a lot easier to use. And so that might be um, a great solution for people with lots and lots of data. 
Yeah, I see that here on the website. It's the B2 cloud storage, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then the um, um, the pricing is actually pretty reasonable here. Uh, obviously, there are you know different services out there, but uh, you know when I check the pricing, it's it's definitely um, you know this is for the personal backup uh, options on Backblaze. It's it's definitely um, definitely doable and and not onerous in any way. So yeah, no personal backup is five dollars a month and it's unlimited. Um, so that's like mm -hmm. <laughs> really inexpensive. And um, yeah, it is. I mean, that's a copy. yeah. And uh, B2 actually is uh, the next comparable service is like Amazon S3, which is mm -hmm. very, very expensive. Um, and a lot of well known applications use this, like Dropbox and these other things. It's an application layer built on top of their storage element. And um, Backblaze is very similar, except it's like a quarter of the price. So for me to store terabytes and terabytes of data, I think um, if I store something like on the order of like six, six terabytes, it's like $30 or less a month, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me to be able to um, leverage um, just direct access or uh, an integration partner, kind of like, um, like a GUI FTP client, um, mm -hmm. It just becomes much, much easier to deal with all my files. It's like I can have exactly what I see on my external drives just on the cloud. It makes it much more, much more convenient. Oh, wow. Yeah. And is that, is that B2 cloud storage, does that also have the option or, or, or will it have the option of uh, being able to, if you needed to get the data back, you know, in, in a uh, more expedient uh, time frame, you could get a hard drive sent to you with the data on it? Um, I, there's nothing like that in place now, currently, but that's not to say that that wouldn't happen in the future. Um, it's a beta, mm -hmm. so uh, what that means is that it's not you know fully baked, and they're still adding functionality and testing it. And um, mm -hmm. but you know, sometime this year that may not be the case, in which case you know it'll be much more accessible, and maybe new features will be added like that. But there's nothing that's um, nothing like that now. And, and in the Backblaze uh, personal uh, backup plans, um, does that doing, uh, I, I'm assuming that it has a, a software interface uh, that you can schedule backups to, to happen on a regular basis, like every night if you wanted to do it that way? Yeah, the Backblaze, then, Backblaze um, application is very easy. I mean, you go to the site and you enter your email and password and then the installer downloads, uh, you install it and it instantly walks you through, you know, backing it up and there's just very few settings. It'll suck up all the data off your computer um, mm -hmm. and it'll take some time uh, depending on what your your connectivity speeds are. Um, sure. But by and large, um, it's very easy. It'll, it will check for incremental updates and uh, you can set the, the frequency and it, it works like a charm. And, and I assume that that's doing uh, an incremental thing where yeah. it's, it's, it's only backing up the, the files that have changed or that are new. That's right. So if a file is deleted or a file is added, then it will. So the, the initial pain point is the first upload, right? If it's, if it's uploading a terabyte drive, it's going to take several weeks. Um, yeah. But then after that, if there's a change, sorry for the noise, um, then it's just going to deal with that one file that's either been deleted or, or added. And, and is there like a number of computers that, that, is there a limit to the computer? So like if I, if I had a system like that, I could back up my own computer, my wife's computer, or uh, how does that work? I think it's a uh, per computer license. So it'd be like $5 for you, $5 for your wife. Um, and that'd be pretty much it. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Well, I'm definitely gonna have to look into that because, um, you know, I, you know, uh, I, I'm glad to hear that uh, you shared some of the initial reservations about online backup that I did, um, you know, back when it was first uh, coming online. But I, I, I knew that, you know, um, the industry had kind of matured somewhat and the technology had matured and moved forward and that it was probably a lot more feasible now than it was maybe, you know, four or five years ago. So I'm definitely going to have to look into that. So 
Thanks for yeah. illuminating that for me. Sure thing. I'm I'm most excited about B2. That's where I'm most excited about because I think <laughs> it's, just, it's just like every time I'm talking, the guy like comes back around. Um, <laughs> wait just a second. So he moves on. All right, so uh, we, we're back from our, our little <laughs> unplanned hiatus to uh, hide from the noise <laughs> of the leaf blower. Um, so anyway, um, you were saying before we were so rudely interrupted there, Jim, uh, about uh, yeah. the, the B2. Yeah, so I think B2 offers the greatest um, opportunity for uh, photographers and videographers, to be honest. Um, you know, while the personal backup is a great deal at five bucks, if you're dealing with multiple drives, um, for example, like my drives are basically by year. Like I, I produce enough content per year that I can fill up, you know, a multi terabyte drive, especially with the advent of video. And then of course, some of these like really high resolution cameras. So for me, um, I may not have my 2009, you know, drive online all the time, in which case if I need a backup and I need something that's archival, then B2 provides a, a much better solution for that um, in the sense that I don't have to worry about the drive not being active for a certain amount of time. There's an unlimited amount of storage uh, as much as I want to use. It's equally as accessible. And, um, you know, it's just something that I can kind of grow into and not, not worry yeah. about as much. So from that perspective, I think it's, a, it's it has a lot more potential um, and it's equally as inexpensive. Um, so basically yeah. uploads are free. Um, so like I could upload six or 10 or 50 terabytes, it's all the same. Um, I'm only charged for um, the monthly storage and then whatever uh, transactions there are, digital transactions and pulling the file down. So it, it seems to me like it's a much better long-term solution for people with tons and tons and tons of data. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Backblaze is gonna, uh, the Backblaze personal backup is still a fantastic service, but I think that it really excels with um, your active drives on your computer. So in my case, I would have, you know, the, the internal hard drive in my main computer, you know, which is maybe a terabyte. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and then I have the, the, the image archive drive, which is at the moment, one drive, yeah. uh, primarily, although I, I, I might have two. So would the personal plan work for me in, in that situation, you know, an yeah. internal drive, my computer? Yeah, yeah and absolutely. Then, yeah. I mean, B2, my, my raving about B2 is uh, much more reflection of my personal needs, which is I have <laughs> just have like tons and tons of data at this point. Um, if I'm, if I'm working with an external driver too, and, um, the internal drives on my computer, B2 personal backup is fantastic. You know, that still is a, a great solution. And what's really nice about that is, is that like, if you say like, hey, my internal drive is one terabyte, but hey, these eight terabyte drives look awesome and I'll try that. Um, it's all the same. I mean, Backblaze personal backup doesn't care whether you have the one terabyte yeah. or the eight terabyte. I mean, I'm sure we care, but you know, yeah. there's no impact to you as the individual. So that is right, also right. very scalable. Okay, all right. Well, good information. I'm, I'm going to have to look into that. So uh, out there uh, in internet land, listeners and viewers, um, the moral of the story is uh, back up your data. If you have been fortunate enough to never have experienced uh, a catastrophic data la loss or a hard drive crash, yeah, you're one of the lucky <laughs> ones. God bless you. I hope that that continues. But uh, uh, as, as is often said in the world, uh, the world of, of hard drives and computers, uh, it, it's not if you'll ever experience a hard drive crash, it's when you'll experience a hard drive crash because they, yeah, the, they do happen. Yeah, the stats are pretty scary. It's something like, you know, two thirds of people will experience some degree of, um, you know, data loss at some point, either you or somebody you know. And it's, uh, it's not a fun experience. I'll, I'll share with you the link of my personal story about it. And then um, there's great resources out there. One of the great things about Backblaze, whether you use them or not, is they do a quarterly update on their drive stats. So if you're looking for a hard drive and you want to see what's reliable, what's not, um, or just see what goes into um, the inner workings of a company of this nature, uh, mm -hmm. their blog and their blog posts are really uh, quite fascinating and they have a lot of really good information about how to back up what backup strategies are really helpful and different things to consider so i'll make sure yeah. that that's available to you as well thank you thank you and um 
And on another note, for those people out there who uh, know that they need to institute some sort of a backup strategy and, and, and routine, uh, and it seems kind of daunting, uh, like a lot of things in life, you know, it, it may seem kind of confusing and, and big and uh, a big thing to take on at first, but once you get into it, once it becomes routine, it becomes easy, and then it just becomes like any other, you know, routine that you have to do, and, you know, then you're protected. So uh, definitely worth the investment of time and energy to get something like that in place. I certainly hope that our conversation here has uh, been useful for you, if, if only to just maybe uh, kind of light a fire on you so you, you go and make that happen. Yeah, it's, it's, the initial yeah. hurdle is the, is the work, but after that, it's you coasting, basically. Yeah, once you get it set up, you can, you can coast, you're right. So, Jim, where can people find uh, out more about you uh, on the web and see some of your, your, beautiful, uh, your beautiful images? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I can always be found online at my website, which is jmg-galleries.com. Uh, my blog is there, which is the most active part of the site, as well as my image archive. And then um, on social media everywhere um, under Jim Goldstein. That's my account name almost everywhere. And on Facebook, I have a Facebook page um, also under JMG Galleries. So um, you can find all those links on my site or maybe I'll provide them to you and you can also have them in a, a blog post or whatnot. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I will definitely, uh, if you send me some links, I'll definitely put put those on uh, the show notes page for, for, for this episode. Uh, and one other thing I want to mention before we, before we segue out of here, uh, in the introduction, I mentioned that we have a Rocky Nook book, book giveaway this episode. And so uh, what you need to do to enter to win the Rocky Nook book giveaway is leave a comment on this page. Uh, tell us what kind of backup software you use. And uh, uh, if you've ever had a catastrophic hard drive failure, you can give us a, couple of words about that uh write a haiku about your your data loss you know get creative with it just leave a comment on the page and that will put your name in the hopper to win any book of your choice from rocky nook press and that is going to be a um a two-week time frame for this entry so uh this episode here is going to be airing on june 7th and so on June 21st, that's when the entries will close for this book giveaway. Anyway, that's what you need to do to win a book from Rocky Nook. And thanks to Rocky Nook for generously sponsoring our book giveaways. A lot of cool books there. Okay, well, Jim, I will see you around in Internet land and uh, look forward to seeing your images and your moon bows and rainbows and uh, other cool uh, scenes that you capture with your camera. Thank you. Hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up in person too sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Take care. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us up to the end of another episode of The Fix. Hey, if you are watching the show on our webpage, thisweekinphoto.com slash The Fix, you can subscribe to the show there. There's a box over on the right side of the page for you to do that very thing. And there's also an email list you can sign up for. That will get you notifications of when new episodes are published, as well as get you access to some exclusive subscriber bonuses that we are in the process of putting together. And if you want to get in touch and leave some feedback about the show, or perhaps uh, offer suggestions about topics you'd like to see covered on future episodes, or maybe uh, other photographers and guests you'd like to see profiled or interviewed about their post-processing technique, you can reach me directly by going up to the top of the page, clicking on the Contact Us link, and then in the little contact form that opens up, make sure you open up that menu in the middle and specify this show, The Fix, to ensure that your message will find its way through the ether and reach me directly. And don't forget, we do have that Rocky Nook book giveaway, and the entries close for that on end of day Tuesday, June 21st. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks very much for watching. We'll catch you next week on The Fix.